Tonight, Dropbox is on an acquisition spree. Facebook wants you and your friends to hang out IRL. And will you look sexy or stupid in Google Glass? The company will let you try out a pair for free. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 68 for Thursday, April 17th, 2014. This episode is brought to you by lynda.com. Learn what you want, when you want, with access to over 2,400 high-quality online courses, all for one low monthly price. To try it free for seven days, visit lynda.com slash TN2. That's L-Y-N-D-A dot com slash TN and the number two. I'm Sarah Lane, and let's get right into the tech feed, shall we? Well, Dropbox just can't stop acquiring companies. Today, news went public that PhotoStream app Loom is now a Dropbox property, and the eight-person team now works on Dropbox's new Carousel photo app. The Loom product is being shut down. Users will be migrated over to Carousel. Also acquired by Dropbox is collaborative document tool Hackpad, an online text editor that competes directly with Google Docs, and corporate chat tool Zulip, which is actually still in private beta. Social ebook reader Readmill was also bought by Dropbox and the deal closed two weeks ago. At a recent press event, Dropbox called its future direction to be a home for life, though Recode reports that internally staff are calling it chapter two. Facebook has begun rolling out a new opt-in feature, that's important, opt-in feature called Nearby Friends, where friends can view other friends' current locations on a map and share exact ongoing location with each other for a limited time. The new feature was built from technology from location sharing app Glance, which Facebook bought in 2012. It adds a list of nearby friends to Facebook's iOS and Android apps and will send notifications if you come within a short distance of a friend. Facebook pulls GPS coordinates to get locations, but unlike other location apps like Foursquare or Google Latitude, it's centered around broadcasting proximity, not actual location. Well, last September, Twitter acquired mobile ad exchange Mopub, and everyone wondered why that was. Today, the company unveiled a new mobile app promotion suite, which uses mobile, Mopub technology, which will allow marketers to promote their apps both on and off of Twitter. Advertisers can now run simultaneous marketing campaigns both on Twitter and Mopub to push users to download their mobile apps with a one-click download button. The Mopub marketplace reaches more than 1 billion unique devices around the world and handles more than 130 billion ad requests every 30 days. So advertisers no longer have to set up ads through separate portals and Twitter gets to rely less on its growing user base, which is not growing as quickly as some hoped, for ad revenue. The new feature is now available to select U.S. advertisers in private beta. Amazon announced today that starting this summer, it will expand voice search functionality in its Fire TV media streaming box to include Hulu Plus, Crackle, and Showtime Anytime. Currently, Fire TV's voice search only supports Amazon's own content and music videos from Vivo. The company also says it's working on features to improve discovery of content included for free with its Prime subscriptions and adding more games to its library of titles. Google Now has an in-home try-on program for Google Glass that lets prospective buyers try on different glass colors, including the titanium collection. 9 to 5 Google reports that these are returned units, so they have their USB ports destroyed. So, as a prospective buyer, you can't actually use the interface. You can just see how a pair might look while you're wearing them. The program is free. There's a $50 charge that's put on a credit card and then returned when the units are returned. Google Glass is expected to be released later this year for less than the current 1500 Explorer price. Coming up, Honda's Asimo robot is getting more lifelike and I don't know, it might be in a creepy way. And up next, I'll talk with Maggie Reardon from CNET a little bit more about how Apple might integrate Shazam into iOS 8. But first, this episode of Tech News Tonight is brought to you by lynda.com, which offers thousands of online video courses in software, creative, and business skills, whether you want to learn about the latest software applications like Lightroom Mobile, or how to protect yourself from the heart bleed bug, or get started with 3D printing. With a lynda.com subscription, members receive unlimited access to the entire course library. It works with software companies to provide you updated training the same day new versions hit the market. So you know you'll always have the latest skills, and you'll learn from top experts, and all of the courses 
are high quality productions. They're not homemade videos that you might find on YouTube that don't look good at all. This is pro stuff. Whether you have 15 minutes or 15 hours, you can learn at your own pace on your own terms. It's $25 a month for access to the entire lynda.com course library or for $37.50 per month, you can subscribe to the premium plan, which also includes exercise files. And you can try lynda.com right now with a free seven-day trial. Visit lynda.com slash TN2 and access the entire library, over 2,400 courses for free for seven days. That's L-Y-N-D-A dot com slash TN2. All right, joining us now is Maggie Reardon, senior writer over at CNET. Hey, Maggie. Hi. How you doing? I'm doing pretty well. Thanks for having me on. Well, thanks for being here. Let's talk a little bit about some of this uh, future of Siri. Uh, we hear from Bloomberg that Apple might build song identification directly into iOS, possibly iOS 8, by partnering with Shazam. How would this work? Well, I think the way it would probably work is uh, you'd be listening to a song and instead of you know having to go in and launch the Shazam app, you could just ask Siri, Siri, what is this song? who sings it, um, and Siri will tell you the answer. Um, so I think, you know, it, it doesn't sound like there's any kind of new magic sauce here or new functionality. It would just be integrated into the, the operating system so that you wouldn't have to download the app, then uh, open the app to be able to use it. Now, according to Nielsen SoundScan, download sales fell last year, and that was the first time since the iTunes Store debuted. Seems to be a trend. There are a lot of streaming music services that now iTunes has to compete with. Is this designed specifically to drive downloads? You know, I would imagine it is because, uh, you know, Apple's very savvy <laughs> in uh, in the moves that it makes, and I'm sure that, that what probably would happen here is, let's say you're out and about and you, you know, identify a song and maybe it takes you right to the iTunes store so that you can buy that song. So I'm sure there's some kind of marketing arrangement that's going on here and that it somehow, you know, funnels you into iTunes so that you can buy something. It seems like everything that Apple has done lately with iTunes is in some way designed to, to make you buy something. <laughs> Which is interesting so. because iTunes radio is so somewhat of a new feature for iTunes, which is more of that streaming service competitor, Pandora competitor, more than a way to get you to buy music. But I have to assume that Shazam, which is a real household name, at least as far as music identification goes, is a good win for Apple either way. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, you know, it's interesting. I don't think it's sort of earth shattering. I don't think it's really going to change the game all that much. I think it would be a nice integration, but you know, again, when people are listening to music services uh, online, like a, an internet radio, I mean, they already know what the song is. Um, so I don't think this is really designed for that. I think it, it is really, you know, to be able to, for people who are already using Shazam or who like that functionality to just be able to use it easier. And I really think that there's got to be some some marketing relationship here where you're you're funneled into iTunes and you know given access to a song to download and you know even though you know Apple has the iTunes streaming service I mean all these services actually uh, give you or many of them give you the option to buy a song too so sure. um, I think that's always sort of the the hope is that people will really love this song and want to listen to it over and over again and and maybe they've been exposed to it because of the, the internet radio and then they'll they'll want to buy it. Right. Always pushing back to purchasing. Well, right. speaking of what Siri could do in the future, uh, four freshmen at the University of Pennsylvania developed, a, 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 well, it's sort of a hack called Googleplex, G-O-O-G-O-L-plex, at a hackathon that gives Siri some interesting new powers like changing your uh, tunes in Spotify or changing the temperature of your Nest thermostat or even starting your Tesla. I have to say, it's pretty impressive. Why isn't Apple building this internally? Maybe they are. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that, that could be the big question, you know, and I, I would see that, you know, Google's probably working on something like this too. I mean, this seems like it's got to be probably the next iteration of, of voice control and voice command. You know, um, I, I think we'll see a lot more of this. And especially as you see companies like Google that are, you know, integrating businesses like Nest uh, into what they're doing, you know, this is where things are going to go. Does it surprise you that, I mean, they're college students, but obviously very smart, but this is not 
terribly difficult to do as a user. You really just need to change your proxy settings. Do you think, that, do you think this is the sort of thing that Apple would go after them for? Um, I don't, I don't know. I mean, if it, if it catches on and it's something that a lot of people are doing, uh, you know, maybe they will, you know, Google or I'm sorry, Apple really doesn't want people messing around with its code, you know, sort of unauthorized. Um, so, you know, they don't provide access to, to the code to be able to do that. Um, you know, they like to keep tight control versus where you see something like Google, where they, they want to see a lot of folks innovating on top of their software and stuff. So, I don't know. I think it remains to be seen what Apple would do, but you know, I don't think this has probably gotten their attention just yet. If it's a few guys in their dorm room just sort of messing around, um, I think that's pretty different than if they tried to build a business around it. Exactly. Well, maybe they are. <laughs> at you this point, know. just a hackathon. <laughs> Maggie Reardon, senior writer over at CNET. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. And tell folks where they can uh, follow your work online and get a hold of you. Well, they can go to CNET.com, uh, and I'm on the news page. And I also write a, a column called Ask Maggie. So if anybody's interested in getting advice about mobile products, mobile services, uh, check out Ask Maggie. Sounds great. Thanks so much, Maggie. Thank you. All right, let's move on now. This is going to be good, guys. Finally, Honda's Asimo robot has really come a long way. The latest version, four feet tall, 115 pounds, has five dexterous fingers on each hand with force feedback sensors. So this is a, its first North America demonstration at the International Auto Show in New York. It was yesterday. Asimo could do a lot of stuff. It could pick up a sealed container and unscrew the top, pick up a piece of paper, navigate a floor, walk up a flight of steps without pausing or falling, all thanks to sensors, including two camera eyes and the sensors in its hands, which can tell what kind of object it is and how much it weighs. Now, Honda started the Asimo project way back in 1996. The robot can understand a handful of phrases at this point, is currently well-skilled at Japanese sign language. The company says it's working on American sign language as well. The robot's battery still doesn't last more than 40 minutes, so it's not necessarily a household item yet. But it can jump in place, it can hop on one foot, and it can even serve you tea. And that's it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. Subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash TN2. Write us at TN2 at twit.tv. And don't miss Tech News Today, tomorrow and every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. I'm Sarah Lane. Thanks for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by cashfly.com.